Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media. Spotlight, we celebrate Valentine's Day. The love story of President Grant and his wife brought to life through a treasure trove of love letters. Plus, take your Valentine to a tropical paradise filled with colorful blooming orchids at the Botanical Garden. And then, science shows how positive interactions with your pets supports your health. But first, an unlikely romance during World War II between two supposed enemies. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. So here's a question. Which of the Allied countries in World War II, in desperate need of nurses, turned away thousands of qualified patriotic volunteers simply because of their race? Society at large didn't want to see black women in uniform. So a very small number actually served. And Eleanor Powell was one of them. Like many black nurses in World War II, instead of tending to the wounds of their countrymen, they were assigned to care for German prisoners of war being held in the United States. The army theorized German soldiers who had been fighting on behalf of a racist regime would not become attracted to women of color. Apparently, Frederick Albert missed the memo. How did they meet? <laughs> it's a great story, really. Um, so apparently, uh, Frederick, his assignment was to work in the mess hall because he was a, a great cook and an excellent baker. And this is what he shared with his children and, his, uh, and other family members. He said he saw her when she walked in, and it's like he was under a spell. Frederick and Eleanor became enemies in love. I think it was youthful rebellion. I think they also were madly in love. Um, but they were, they were taking major risks. I mean, here you are, have an American nurse in the army, and he's in Hitler's army. So we are enemies at war. So she could have been court-martialed had um, their romance been uh, discovered. But now their story has been discovered by journalist Alexis Clark, who spent years documenting this incredible story of courage in a time of war and marriage in a time of hate. It's a collision of Jim Crow and Nazism. Even though we're at war, these are two countries that have racialized laws. So they both were committing crimes. So you really think about, wow, they just, they erased all of that. And so I think, yes, it was, they're, they're young, they're rebellious, but they also hated what their countries were um, putting forth and, and selling this racism, because that's, that's not what were in their hearts either. And there probably weren't too many people who had the same experiences, background, attitudes in the Army. The fact uh, that uh, they would find each other is pretty amazing. I think so too, because they really weren't so, ever supposed to be with each other when you think about that time period. Well, really, it's called, I mean, it's called enemies in love, but they weren't on that level enemies at all. It seems like the enemies were their own country men and women. I agree. I agree. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Do you think if they would have met somehow later in life, older, they would have gone ahead and and gotten together, or was this sort of a, I know. a moment of youth? I think youth was on their side, for sure. Um, and not that you're young, that you're not thoughtful, but I do think there is something, um, just there is more wisdom um, and more fear as you get older. You know what this world can be like. So I think it helped them that they um, hadn't experienced that much of life yet. Well, the book is Enemies in Love. And it's terrific. And Alexis Clark, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. A profound feeling overcame Frederick when he spotted a beautiful, tall black woman. Incapable of concentrating on his kitchen duties, Frederick bypassed the POW waiters and walked right up to Eleanor. He looked her in the eyes, smiled, and said with a German accent, you should know my name. I'm the man who is going to marry you. 
Watch the full interview to hear more details about their beautiful love story at HECmedia.org. HEC Media, bringing you culture and community. Find all of HEC's positive programming and award-winning content at HECmedia.org. History Spotlight, brought to you by HEC Media and the Missouri Historical Society. Hello, I'm Dr. Jody Sowell, president of the Missouri Historical Society in St. Louis, and this is History Spotlight. Most equate President Ulysses S. Grant with the brutalities of the Civil War and the complexities of his presidency. But at home, there was a different side of it. Public historian Amanda Clark describes the love story of President and Mrs. Grant, brought to life through a treasure trove of love letters. Ulysses S. Grant was known as a pretty brutal and unrelenting leader on the battlefield. His presidential legacy tends to be a mixed one, plagued with scandals. But at home, Grant was a devoted husband and left behind a treasure trove of some of the best love letters you will ever read. Grant meets Julia Dent in St. Louis in fittingly February of 1844. It was a pretty classic setup. Julia's brother Fred brought his college roommate Ulysses home to meet the family. Julia was not known for her beauty, but Grant quickly fell hard for her wit and their shared love of horses. Four months later, they're crossing a swollen creek in a wagon. Julia says something about clinging to him for safety. When they're safe to the other side, Grant asks her to cling to him for the rest of her life and offers her his West Point ring. She accepts, but the engagement had to be kept secret for over a year. Their relationship had several Romeo and Juliet type aspects. She comes from wealth, he does not. His family were staunch abolitionists, while her family held over 70 people enslaved. The Mexican-American War would keep the two apart for several years before they were able to finally marry in 1848. Throughout that separation, Grant writes Julia these intense letters, these declarations of his love. You know how awkwardly I made known to you the first time of my love? It is a scene that I often think of, and with much pleasure did I hear that my offer was not entirely unacceptable. In going away now, I feel as if I have someone else than myself to live and to strive to do well for. You can have but little idea of the influence you have over me, Julia, even while so far away. If I feel tempted to do anything that I think is not right, I'm sure to think, well now, if Julia saw me, would I do this? And thus it is absent or present, I am more or less governed by what I think is your will. During the Civil War, Grant knew that he was a better general if she was somewhere nearby, and he sends for her. She leaves the children with relatives in St. Louis, she travels to the different encampments, sometimes in really dangerous situations, and over the course of the Civil War, she stays with him during campaigns at Memphis, Vicksburg, Nashville, and in Virginia. But it wasn't just when they were apart that he wrote these incredible letters. At one point, Julia wanted to have surgery on her eyes, which were crossed and a source of insecurity, and Grant writes, Dear Julia, I don't want to have your eyes fooled with. They are all right as they are. They look just as they did the very first time I ever saw them. The same eyes I looked into when I fell in love with you, and the same eyes that looked up into mine and told me that my love was returned. Next on History Spotlight, an island named for the numerous duels fought there. To learn more about the Missouri Historical Society, visit mohistory.org. HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, honored time and again for excellence in the industry. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. We are here at the Missouri Botanical Garden for our annual orchid show. This is a beloved event that people come to every winter because it's a chance to see hundreds of beautiful, blooming tropical plants. And where else can you see that in the winter in St. Louis? So we have people that flock to the garden for this little taste of the tropics. You can see different plants each time you come. Our horticulture staff switches out the orchids as they come into bloom and they're in almost every color of the rainbow. And it's a beautiful oasis in the winter. One thing that is unique about the orchid show here at the Missouri Botanical Garden is that all of the orchids in the show are part of our permanent collection, meaning they are here at the garden year round. Right now we are in our greenhouse at the Missouri Botanical Garden where they live the rest of the year when they're not in the show, and our horticulturalists spend the year caring for them to make sure they're beautiful and blooming in time for the orchid show. Right now we're in one of our greenhouses where we propagate and take care of and maintain all of our orchid specimens. 
and most of the time uh, the public does not have access to this uh, space. However, the great thing is we do bring our orchids out at certain times of the year, such as our orchid show, which is occurring right now. Orchids are part of a one big family, the Orchidaceae family, and they are one of the largest plant families in the world with somewhere between 20 and 30,000 species. They occur on almost every continent except Antarctica. And they can range in size from the size of your pinky, even sometimes a little smaller, all the way up to the size of your hand and maybe even uh, bigger in terms of flowering. When our orchids are not on display, our horticulture staff take really good care of all of our orchids here. They're constantly having to make sure that our orchids are properly watered. Some of them like drier conditions, so we'll back off on watering for them. Some of them like more moisture, so we may have to water them a little bit more frequently. We're also making sure that they don't have any pests and diseases, removing any spent flowers to ensure health. And one of the other things too is, of course, our orchids grow like any other plant. And so oftentimes we have to do a lot of repotting. So we'll work to strategically figure out which ones are in most dire straits and find a bigger size pot to put them up in. Or we may actually even propagate them, splitting them up or dividing them into smaller sections so that we have more specimens. So the reason why the Missouri Botanical Garden focuses on orchids or has this collection is because a lot of these plants are endangered or threatened in the wild. And unfortunately we may not see them if not properly cared for. So having this massive collection allows us to conserve these plants so that we can have them for future generations and also learn about them so that we can also translate that to any other projects that we work on with orchids. Orchids are a long part of the Missouri Botanical Garden's history dating back to the 1800s. The orchid show itself is more than 100 years old and is a beloved tradition for the St. Louis community. We hope you can make it out to the Orchid Show, which runs through February 25th. It is your only chance each year to see this many orchids from our wonderful orchid collection. It's included with General Garden Admission, open every day from 9 to 5, and you can get your tickets and learn more about it at mobot.org. Later on Spotlight, dating in the bug world. Find out why this love can be extremely dangerous. There's nothing sweeter than showing love and appreciation on Valentine's Day. It's incredibly important to talk about uh, how companion animals um, impact our lives, particularly on a holiday like Valentine's Day. Our companion animals are a member of the family. Gretchen Carlisle is a research scientist in the Research Center for Human-Animal Interaction at the University of Missouri College of Veterinary Medicine. Some of the center's research is sponsored by Purina. Carlisle says celebrating Valentine's Day with pets benefits people and animals. For pet owners, it can ease loneliness and depression. Valentine's Day is, you know, this is the holiday for couples and romance and love. And for those people who um, do not have a significant human other, those companion animals can really help fill that social role and provide companionship, comfort, and unconditional love. For the furry companions, Valentine's Day treats and toys go a long way for them too. And we are paying attention to them. They are really going to thrive on that. Uh, that positive uh, relationship. There is some literature that shows it's beneficial to humans when they are able to care for the needs of a companion animal. For dog owners, being loving to dogs may be one way their loving heart stays healthy. For instance, dog walking is a loving thing to do with heart-healthy benefits for people and dogs. People can be more likely to stick to a fitness routine if they're doing it with a companion animal. As the trend has been for people to have more obesity, um, that same trend has trickled out to our best friends. There is a growing body of literature, and in fact, the American Heart Association acknowledges that having a companion animal can really contribute to people's cardiovascular health. Some of that may be through less loneliness and depression, decreased stress, but you know, really that increased physical activity, particularly for those people who live with dogs. Carlisle says research has shown that simply petting a dog lowers the stress hormone cortisol and social interaction between people and their dogs actually increases levels of the feel-good hormone 
oxytocin, which is the same hormone that bonds mothers to babies. We're talking about Valentine's Day. Oxytocin is really known as the love hormone. We know that both dogs and people can get that, that elevation in oxytocin when they are engaged with one another. The cortisol-lowering and oxytocin-boosting benefits can also help keep blood pressure at bay. Being able to do something special for our dogs um, and our cats, we're benefiting as well. And speaking of cats, the Feline Genetics and Comparative Medicine Lab is the research laboratory of Dr. Leslie Lyons. Her lab is also nicknamed the Lyons Den. She is a professor of comparative medicine in the University of Missouri College of Veterinary Medicine. Lyons says the simple acts of hugging and petting cats on Valentine's Day and every day is known to lower your blood pressure. Several studies have shown that actually petting your cat, so probably taking the time to sit down, relax, pet your cat, give your cat some nice long strokes, and take that moment of time out actually helps to lower people's blood pressures. And of course, if we have lower blood pressure and interacting with our companion animals, our pet cats and dogs, will certainly add to our heart health. Celebrating Valentine's Day with your pets is not just about taking time out for your dogs and cats. There's research on fish. Merely watching fish can lower people's blood pressure. Health benefits are related to the attachment to the companion animals. And so if the best match for a person may be a quiet bunny or a guinea pig. Maybe it's their chickens outside that they engage with. So Valentine's Day just might be the perfect day to spread the love to all creatures, both great and small. For more St. Louis stories, subscribe to the HEC YouTube channel. Connect STL from HEC Media. with metal, I like to transform it into something that's lightweight looking and that's really one of the great characteristics about working with metal is that it's such a strong material. You can make light and airy shapes that are strong and structural. A lot of times it is really just focused. It's focused energy. It, it's kind of like, you know, when you ask a musician what's going through their head when they're soloing. Paying attention to the curves, the way that the metal's forming, it's, it's kind of hard to explain how it, what's actually going through my head when I'm creating something. It's, it's almost indescribable. My name is Dan Crabtree, and I'm a blacksmith. A blacksmith works with iron. Uh, metalsmiths work with all varieties of materials. I guess I'm a little bit of both. My name is Scott DeLorme, and I am a metalsmith slash fabricator slash welder. <laughs> I like to take a piece of flat material and form it and transform it into something that's three-dimensional and interesting. You'll see how these are straight, and these look like as if they're trying to capture light. They're bending around the blossom, and that's what we want to do. We want to make it look like these leaves are actually reaching for sunlight and growing, and that makes it look even more real. It adds a little bit more time, but man, is it a good detail. When most people see our roses, they think, uh, they think they're real at first. A lot of people think that we dip our roses in metal, that we take a live rose and dip it or something like that, but that's not the case. When we make our roses, we start with flat bars and sheets, and we have to hammer and forge every detail into them. I really do enjoy metal because it's sturdy yet malleable. It's forgiving yet really stubborn.
HEC Media, supporting and promoting the arts. Check out our features and shows on theater, dance, music, the visual arts, and more. Find this and all our award-winning content at hecmedia.org. I carried a watermelon. Love. It can make people say... I carried a watermelon. And do some pretty crazy things. We might think that our behaviors as a species are interesting and if anything like my family sometimes a little bit weird when it comes to uh, courtship. You know, how many of us have not been embarrassed by how our father is trying to impress our mother at the kitchen table? <laughs> Save the neck for me, Clark. But the things that bugs do make us look plain and boring. Here's just one example. Some of these moths at the butterfly house will emerge without any mouth parts. So they can't eat. They have just one job. Find a female and mate before they die. And moths are masters of chemical romance. Fortunately, males do have huge furry antenna to receive those chemical messages from females. Moths, females will secrete a pheromone that can attract males from nearly 30 miles away. If he's lucky, she's a few meters away. If he's unlucky, she's 28 miles. He's got a bit of a flight to go and his hope is that he gets there before any other male does, following that pheromone trail. Some predators have keyed in on this fact that those pheromones are irresistible. There's types of spiders that actually can produce the moth mating pheromone to attract male moths to them. So you know, you're a male moth, you get a lovely whiff of the, the lovely melange of a female, you go flying towards her, and instead of finding this gorgeous, larger, feathery intended female, you're in the grasp of a spider and becoming it its next meal. So, you know, love is dangerous. It's not always uh, ro roses and sometimes it's uh, finding the wrong species and becoming someone's dinner. Some bugs try to buy their way out of treacherous mating situations with large gifts. We think, you probably hear a lot about the praying mantis and most of them know that sometimes mantids especially the male mantids, literally lose their head in the courtship ritual. So the females will eat the male, um, provides her with nutrients so she can give those nutrients to the babies. It's not always the case. It's not fait accompli that if you're a male mantis that you're gonna lose your head in mating, but it's not uncommon. Uh, spiders are kind of the same way. A lot of times the male spiders are a lot smaller than the females. So they overcome this by preventing, presenting the females with nuptial gifts, which are food. So essentially, here, let me give you something else to eat while we take the time to breed, and if I'm lucky, I'm gonna get everything said and done and gone before you finish this meal. So uh, there's some, been fun studies done where they've shown that the males will go after larger prey items as nuptial gifts, and of course, going after prey isn't risk-free. The larger the prey item, the bigger the risk. The males are taking this risky behavior because it's also risky to show up with a, a gift that's too small because if she finishes it too fast, you're the second course. Believe it or not, cockroaches are some of the more romantic suitors. The males will sometimes set the mood with a meal for the females and even stick around to help provide for the family. I think many of us don't think much about bug social lives. They come together to find a mate, of course, but they also come together to find food, to find a habitat, to share resources. Very often these group displays do have impacts on us too. Roaches are, again, a really good example because the things that they do enrich the soil and help us out tremendously. All of these eat, pray, love tendencies are on display at the Butterfly House in February. Plus, it's releasing thousands of these big, bright, blue morpho butterflies. More than we have at any other time of the year. As a part of its morpho Mardi Gras. You'll see our blue, blue morphos. You'll get to learn a, bit, a little bit about bug courtship and a lot about what makes bugs the party animals that they are. And in terms of crazy bug love stories. We haven't yet talked about hermaphrodites or even animals that can change their sex over time. These entomologists have a lot more they could share with you. It's a wild, wild world out there. And when you learn about the level of danger involved in some of these creatures' courtships. Fireflies are another amazing example of deceit. The males and the females have this uh, light ship ritual that is specific to the species. So the males will do a pattern that attracts the right spe a female so they can come together and further the species. 
Well, there are some females that are, um, they're called Futurus fireflies, which is unique is that the female adults actually eat. A lot of times the adults won't eat, they come together to breed and that's the end of it. Well, these females want to be able to provide their eggs with a chemical defense. And they get the chemical for that defense from other firefly males. So these Futurus fireflies are known as the Femme Fatale. They actually show a light pattern that attracts males of a different species. It's not the males of their species, it's a different type of firefly that she attracts in. And uh, of course, a rude awakening for him, it's not the right female, it's a female that's gonna eat him. She eats him and then she takes the chemicals from him, puts them into her eggs so that her eggs are distasteful. All of this may give you a more positive perspective on love as we know it. We appreciate being a human a lot more because as complicated as dating is, for a male, I never worried about getting my head bit off, never had to worry about uh, losing any body parts or the female just straight up eating me. And uh, while my gifts were present, they weren't maybe as necessary as they are, my life didn't depend upon me. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. I can only give you love that lasts forever And that promise to be near each time you call And the only heart I own For you and you alone That's all, that's all I can only give you country walks in springtime And a hand to hold when leaves begin to fall and a love whose burning light will warm the winter night. That's all. That's all. There are those I am sure who have told you they would give you the world for a toy. Oh, I have a these arms to enfold you, and a lifetime can never destroy you. If you're wondering. But I'm asking in return, dear You'll be glad to know that my demands are small Say it's me that you'll adore For now and evermore That's all That's all Next week, WashU researchers develop an indoor air monitor that detects viruses, plus a revealing and fascinating new biography of Abraham Lincoln. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.